Hello, I'm Gavin Givanoni. I'm a neurologist based in London, and I'd like to welcome you to the second part of this innovation podcast where we're looking at the urgency of change in MS care. And we're going to focus uh, this time on what we can do potentially to address the unmet need. I'd just like to welcome my panel. I'll start off with Casey. Casey, a quick introduction. I'm glad to be back. I'm Casey Minnis. I'm the executive director of the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation. Amy? Thank you for uh, allowing me back. I'm Amy Perrin Ross. I'm an advanced practice nurse in the Chicago area. And Leora? So glad to be back as well. I am uh, Leora Freeman. I am a neuroimmunologist and medical director of the MS and Neuroimmunology Center at the University of Texas at Austin. So let's get down to some specifics. So we made the point that in the, in the first podcast that there is quite a large unmet need where the healthcare system is configured and how we manage multiple sclerosis. So now we're going to drill down into a, a component of the disease that I think is really important, and uh, it's the big unmet need. And it's quite clearly this concept that even though we have very effective treatments for multiple sclerosis and we render our, well, all the majority of people now free of relapses and focal activity on MRI scan with monitoring, yeah, a large proportion uh, of them are still noticing that they're getting worse. Uh, and some of us refer to this as worsening or progression independent of relapse activity. And th there's this concept that there's a smoldering type pathology that's going on. So I'll, I want to go to, um, to Casey. Like Casey, a lot of technology or innovation is trying to address the monitoring of this to detect it, not only in the healthcare environment, but also self-monitoring. Self you know, maybe you want to make a, you know, how do you feel about people with the disease monitoring their own worsening and, and how they address that from a psychological perspective? I think that it's essential um, that the people with MS really are the starting point for being able to monitor what's going on with them because unfortunately, some of these symptoms are very subtle and not easy for their medical professionals to see. I had mentioned in part one about the high unemployment rate for people with MS. At any given time, more than 50% of people with MS are unemployed. And the main reasons for leaving the workplace are fatigue and cognitive changes, which are very difficult symptoms uh, to monitor, especially in the short time that a healthcare professional is seeing someone with MS. So that sort of self-monitoring, if there were a way for individuals with MS to track changes in their cognition or track changes in their fatigue levels mm -hmm. to give the healthcare provider a little bit more objective information, I think that it would really help. Uh, so many times people with MS are talking to their healthcare provider about fatigue or cognitive changes and there really isn't much coming back to them uh, because these aren't symptoms that are generally very treatable. So the doctors, maybe it isn't clicking that this is an issue of progression, a signal of progression. And if the patients were able to provide them with a snapshot over time of how they've been experiencing these symptoms, I think that could be a game changer. So you actually think people with the disease should be uh, activated or should be given the tools to monitor this outside of uh, the healthcare environment? Absolutely. I mean, you can't monitor fatigue in a 30-minute visit with a neurologist every six months. The only way to really see the impact of fatigue or cognitive changes on a person's life is to track how that's happening over time. So, Amy, when I talk to nurse practitioners and allied staff, they say, oh, God, this is just another thing to address. So the question I'm asking you is from a uh, nursing practitioner perspective, how do you tell patients this and how do you deal with this issue in a one-to-one -one environment with the, with the patient? Well, one of the things uh, that I encourage my patients to do very early on in the disease Gavin is to journal um, to uh, document what they're experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. And that goes back to, to Casey's comment about the fact that you can't assess fatigue in a 30-minute visit. Well, unfortunately, in our scenario, it's a 20-minute visit, so that's even more difficult. All that being said, 
I agree with you. I get overwhelmed if a patient comes in with a huge stack of papers. What I want these folks to do with their journaling is to document their experiences, their highs, their lows, what worked, what didn't for them on any given day for whatever their symptoms were. And then they need to do some preparation before they come in for a visit with me or my colleagues. And that is to go through that journal and call out things, look at patterns perhaps of fatigue or times when their cognition wasn't what they thought it might be and document that. Those are some of the key issues then that we would talk about. And we would look at addressing some of those issues. I mean, one of the things that I very, very strongly encourage my patients to get involved in is some sort of physical activity, whether that's physical therapy or yoga or mindful meditation or any of those kinds of things. And when people come to me and tell me how fatigued they are and I turn around to tell them I want them involved in physical therapy, they just don't get it. But if they're journaling and they're pulling out instances and experiences when they've had some of these symptoms, what worked and what didn't in terms of dealing with them, those are things that we can get right into a discussion about in our very limited time in the clinic. So I think what you're also suggesting is that you, want, you would like uh, uh, the information to be curated, in other words, summarized uh, with you know, maybe trajectories, so it's actually useful and saves time. Uh, and I think some of the innovations that are coming out in terms of monitoring applications can potentially do this. My big issue in my practice is unless this information is put into the work stream, uh, and the work stream is dictated, I hate to say this, by our electronic health record, unless it comes into the electronic health record it's in the work stream, it's incredibly difficult for uh, healthcare professionals to use this information, I think, productively and make the most of it. And I think this is one of the things where technology can really change, particularly now that software packages have these things called API in the application, in, in these interfaces where they talk to each other, so it could happen. Now, Leora, can I move to high tech now? <laughs> uh, we have been monitoring uh, MS with quite simple, basic MRI metrics for decades. You know, can't we go beyond that? Is there something we can do from an innovation perspective that can you know, at least take this process, uh, well, the thinking beyond focal inflammation, relapse and MRI activity, and look at the disease more holistically or in more depth? Absolutely. I mean, I, I agree with, you know, what, what's been said. I mean, now that we have therapies that address relapses very effectively, we need to go beyond this and the help understand progression and, and the risk for progression, particularly, you know, individually, because, you know, there are as many MS as there are people living with MS. And, you know, we've tried to approach the situation by looking at some prognostic factors, you know, being a man or having lesions in the spinal cord, those are prognostic factors for high risk for progression. But I think in this new era of MS care, uh, we really need to drill down and utilize technology to be able to understand individual courses of MS and predict this course so that we can act early uh, rather than retroactively. And um, for this, we need new technologies. As you said, we've been looking at MRIs the same way since I was a medical student, and that's that's way too long. However, there's been all kind of research that has been done. Uh, I feel very hopeful that we're entering an era of biomarkers, whether we're talking about fluid biomarkers or imaging biomarkers, uh, that are going to help us tease out the individual biology of the disease and individual people with MS. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of research done around neurofilament light chain. We also see a lot of emerging data with uh, GFAP and other serum biomarkers. I've been myself very involved in the neuroimaging field, so just really fascinated about how can we just image the pathology of MS just with a greater understanding. I mean, white matter lesions in MS are the tip of the iceberg. There's so much that's going on within the brain, within lesions, around lesions, in the you know normal appearing white matter or gray matter uh, that we're not capturing we're, with our technology. And it's really fascinating to me to see all the research that's been done with 
uh, with MRI, um, whether it is looking at, you know, the central vein sign to diagnose people earlier, whether it is looking at paramagnetic rim lesions that give us an idea of those chronic active lesions uh, directly in the brain of people with MS. I'm also very fascinated by everything that's happening on, you know, with PET imaging that can really, through molecular imaging, be able to really dive deeply in the, the individual pathology. But we have to be clear that those innovations in research are only that unless we develop an understanding of how to use them in routine practice, how to make them actionable, and then also how to make them accessible to all people living with MS. And that I think that's the second part of the innovation that we need. Right, we need new ways of of testing those biomarkers in specific clinical contexts to have the level of evidence to make these biomarkers, you know, reimbursed by payers, properly understood and actionable. And then we really need to find new ways that we can, you know, test patients with MS. Does everything need to be done at a healthcare facility? Uh, could we have, you know, finger prick um, tests to look at? some blood biomarkers rather than having to go to a facility to get a blood draw. There's so much that can be done, but it has to really be clinically applicable, clinically actionable and accessible to all. The exciting times because you've got all this stuff and how to incorporate into practice. Now, this is one of the issues, some people in the field, I'm not saying me, <laughs> they say, well, you've got all this information now, be it self-monitoring, uh, albeit monitoring you're doing clinic from a physical perspective or using biomarkers or imaging. And you tell the patients, you're doing really, really well. You haven't had a relapse and your MRIs are stable. You've got no new lesions. However, uh, I'm detecting that things are getting worse. Now, most people with the disease, well, some people with the disease may take that as bad news. And so the question I'm, ask, I'm going to ask all three of you is, how do you make that information come across that it's not bad news? So, Casey, I'll stay with you. So, how do you tell a person with the disease that information without making them uh, get depressed and feel it's negative? Honestly, I think for most people, it would be validating. I think for most people, when progression is happening, they're aware that progression is happening and it's not going to come as a surprise to them. But I also feel that the more that we're able to identify progression independent of relapse happening, the better idea we're going to have of how effective the current treatments we have are on progression. So I think whatever way you look at it, it's an important truth to identify. Okay, so I like that term validating. So now, Amy, you've got this information. Can you use that information as a segue to drive treatments that are maybe not MS-specific to improve MS outcomes in clinical practice? Well, I think um, in talking to our patients about the fact that there is progression, one of the things that I often discuss is the concept of aging and immune senescence and the fact that the good news is we're now gathering more and more information about aging with a disease like MS because 25 or 30 years ago, aging wasn't a possibility. Uh, people are dying much younger and, and having, you know, catastrophic consequences. Today, if people start early with a disease modifying therapy and stick with it in some form, their outlook is much, much better. But as Casey said, we need to validate that changes are happening. There is progression, but some of that progression may be aging, some of that progression may be comorbidities. And so again, I go back to focusing on what can we do to help these people live the healthiest lives possible? whether that's things like physical therapy, uh, diet and exercise, nutrition. Um, again, I stress the concept of hope for these people. There is reason to be very hopeful because there are no new lesions on your MRI. There does not appear to be any uh, visible signs of progression on the MRI. Clinically, your exam hasn't changed. Those are good things. Yes, we may experience some progression. Let's do what we can to manage life outside of MS to help you live the healthiest life possible with MS. 
And Leora, coming to you now um, as a neurologist, I so I assume this is a call to arms to develop, you know, add-on or new therapies. Uh, you know, what do you think is the most exciting in terms of innovation in the field around addressing this unmet need? I agree with what Casey and Amy have said. I think that if we explain to our patients the new framework, that we're adopting a proactive framework rather than the retroactive framework, then our patients can be excited and empowered and validated. I think, yes, for us, it is a call to arms. Um, we have grown in our understanding of the mechanisms driving disability progression, and we have grown in our understanding of how we can measure progression and its biological underpinnings, I think now it's really time to see how we can creatively uh, either design, test newer medications that can address, you know, the disease beyond the peripheral inflammatory process. So really looking at medications that can get into the brain that can target uh, the smoldering um, inflammatory process with this microglial activation, leptomeningeal inflammation uh, that can really be neuroprotective, uh, promote myelin repair uh, is also important. And there are a lot of trials and people working on these uh, newer therapy and newer avenues for treatment. I think that um, it's important also to, to, to think that all what we learn about the patient experience and how we learn to layer this with technology is really critical because we need to have a much deeper understanding of the experience of progression to develop effective trials. Um, right now, our understanding of progression in MS clinical trial is very limited, bare bone, EDSS progression, just a you know, ambulatory marker, essentially. Uh, but we know, as Casey mentioned earlier, that progression is much more complex and nuanced um, cognition, fatigue, day-to-day -day functioning, um, you know, ability to perform the work. And so we really need to integrate the patient experience to be able to tease out the biomarkers that can allow us to test properly the efficacy of those novel therapies. Wow, this is like uh, opening up uh, Pandora's box. Uh, I think, you know, we've discussed so much here yeah. Uh, and I think we're probably going to have to additional podcasts to drill down into the individual issues. But I, I think, you know, if I have to summarize these two parts to this to this podcast, it's clear that there's much more to MS than we thought in the past. We have to go way beyond just targeting uh, relapses and focal MRI activity and actually look at whatever else is happening beyond that. And that's not only on an educational level, but also creating a new healthcare system in a way. So we can you know, empower patients to self-monitor, how that self-monitoring data gets curated and put into the electronic patient record into our work stream and how we as healthcare professionals respond to that and then develop new treatments uh, to, to help with that, that component. So there's lots to be done. And I think at every component, every step of the way, there's innovation that's necessary. So I hope you uh, will enjoyed listening to the thoughts of the, these three excellent uh, panelists. Uh, and I would urge you to spread the word. So if you think this is useful to other people, please send them the link. Uh, and please don't hesitate to contact us by email at ms.innovationchallenge at roche.com for two reasons, maybe even to ask questions, but also to suggest future topics because there's going to be additional podcasts uh, in this series. And you know, you know, we don't want to be coming up with the ideas of what needs to be discussed in these podcasts all the time. So some feedback from the community that would be greatly appreciated. And I'd just like to uh, end by thanking my panelists, Casey, Amy, and Leora. Thank you very, very much. You've been great. Thank you. A pleasure to be with you, Gavin. Thank you.